welcome to the Massachusetts School of Law Educational Forum. I am Diane Sullivan, your host for today's show. Thank you for joining us. This program is brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law at Andover. During today's show, you'll hear the story of Lance Allred and his dream and his pursuit to play in the NBA. We'll hear about growing up in a polygamous commune, about being deaf, about Lance's struggles with obsessive compulsive disorder, and picking up a basketball for the very first time when he was in the eighth grade. He will take us inside the competitive world of basketball. Listen to what he writes in his book, Long Shot. With the first day now over, nine more were left before the final cut. I was now alone, letting my tears flow as water pounded my back, heavy with the weight of my dreams. Here I was, in Boise, trying to earn a $12,000 contract in the NBA Development League. $12,000. Was that my worth? This was the last run, the end of the line, and I knew it. Lance, turning back the clock of time, tell us a little bit about your early years in Pinesdale, Montana. I grew up in a polygamous commune, Pinesdale, Montana, which had been founded by my grandfather, Ruin Allred, in the early 1960s to escape persecution for his religious beliefs. However, I was used to any sort of lifestyle, really, because my father only had one wife the whole time I've known him. And, you know, at one point he did have a second wife, but she left shortly after I was born. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have any recollection of her. And so it was normal to me to have one wife or multiple wives. And it was basically your preference. And it, it didn't, you know, it didn't, uh, you know, come to my attention that, hey, this is kind of weird or whatnot, until I finally started to get older and I started going to public school outside of Pinesdale, that I saw, oh, okay, people call us Pineys, so we must be somewhere different. And, you know, it, it, it was fun, though. As a kid, it was a fun place to grow up because you had all these little kids running around, like Smurfs, playing tag, hide and seek, pine cone wars and whatnot. And, you know, I had over 400 first cousins. <laughs> and wow. I couldn't, I, I wouldn't be able to name them all for you, obviously. But, you know, we, we have fun. I enjoyed it very much. And so, but you know, in, ignorance is bliss. And I was very innocent at the time. And it was a good time. Tell me what it's like specifically to take a seat at the table in a polygamous kitchen. Well, you know, if I always tell the story, if you sit quietly long enough in a polygamous home, you will see all the sister wives and all the dynamics come out very quickly in that Oh, I bet. <laughs> uh, yeah, they will they will band together to, you know, force the husband to give them something. But once one sister wife leaves and then another sister wife leaves, they all kind of start to nip at nip at each other, you know, start backbiting. And then eventually, when the husband comes home and there's only one wife, she'll sell them all down the river to get what she wants. And so it's, it's a fascinating and very entertaining dynamic that you see, and it's human nature. It really is so unrealistic to ask a woman to share her husband with another man and think that it's just going to be all fun and games. <laughs> it, it, it's not. And I could tell you that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You saw a lot of, a lot of ache and anxiety in the women. I remember when my aunt, who I love very much, had to allow her husband to be given away to a second wife. She, on the surface, on the facade, was very calm and very grateful to be sh sharing her husband to the principal of it. But I remember when he left on his honeymoon, I saw my aunt crying alone in the bedroom. I mean, it was hard. And it's and a, a common misnomer that people have is that, you know, all polygamists are sex fiends or whatnot. Or I mean, no, actually, a lot of them are very celibate, and that very archaic, and that you only have intercourse for the sake of procreation, and so it becomes very strict like that, and so it's not, it's not all this romance and beauty that a lot of people. Uh, big love will sometimes portray and uh, I've, I watched it once and having my intelligence insulted I never watched it again but obviously that's part of TV entertainment to you know sensationalize some aspects that are pretty exaggerated. As an infant everybody believed that you were mentally challenged you were not you were <laughs> deaf 
What special um, and unique problems does being a deaf toddler present? Oh, you get frustrated. You can't understand what people are saying to you. Sure. And you want them to look at you, and they're talking, there, but they're not looking at you when they talk. And you, so you go and grab their face and scream at them in incoherent words back because that's what it sounds like to you. And, you know, obviously there's frustration there as a kid. And, you know, it's especially you know that people are functioning in a way that you find it very difficult. And so you know eh, it shouldn't be this hard. And so, therefore, I did have a lot of um, time pent outs. up anger and timeouts. Yes, <laughs> a lot I of was, timeouts. I was a champion at the timeout chair <laughs> and the uh, yellow paddle that my father so lovingly made for me. It, well, he didn't make it for me exclusively, he made it for all the kids, but I, I pretty much wore that one down to the bone. <laughs> Tell us about your dad's fall from the ladder, his return to the college, and the outrage that triggered in your community. Father, while building a home uh, for the AUB, the Apostolic United Brethren, fell off a ladder and he broke it, but then within the same year, did it again. He didn't fall off the ladder though, he was actually on stilts doing some drywalling stuff and his just fall, fell and his leg broke and shattered. So therefore, he had no money coming in, didn't have any, any way to support his family, yet there was an issue that his older brother owed him money, but the AUB, the, the elders of the group, are saying, well, we shouldn't have to pay you because Rex owes you money. My dad's brother, my uncle, is saying, well, I shouldn't have to pay you because the AUB owes you money because you got injured while working for them. And so it became this obviously just diversionary tactic on both sides to avoid having to pay my father any money to help him. And, and meantime, his leg is shattered. Leg is shattered. You people need to eat. Yeah. And everybody's getting angry because they yeah. don't want your father to get educated. Why? Exactly. And so what happens was my father at the point said, you know, I'm going back to school. I'm going to go do it. And they said, well, you know, if you go back to school, you lose your faith. You lose your testimony. And they were right about it. And because they were accurate on that. Because as my father taught me and I learned from him that the more you learn the life, the more you learn how little you know. But usually the people that think they know everything are the ones that know very little or have a lot, very little respect or appreciation of other ways of life. And so you don't want to say those who are poorly educated, you know, you don't want to generalize it like that. But usually the ones that are the most opinionated are the ones that don't always know what they're talking about. And so I learned that from my father. When, he, when you grow up, I, saw, I would see my father very slow to voice his opinion, but I knew he was very intelligent, much more so than these other men that were very quick to voice their opinions on things. And a lot of times they would just say stuff and like, that doesn't make any sense. Why would they say that? And I would see my father do the exact opposite. So it was a great lesson right then as a kid to learn of just, you know, the power of education and the, the uh, you know, just the different ways of thought because it was a very exclusive community that was very oppressive at the time but my father was very much able to champion that idea and since he was able to go back and do it and graduate valedictorian while supporting five kids building a home for his family he and mom and their four kids were living with my grandmother and they accidentally got pregnant with me and so they're all shacked up in this one little house. Dad's going back to school. And the only way he can do it is to go downtown to Hamilton and apply for welfare. That again infuriated people because it made the elders in the Oliver group look bad, like they couldn't support their own. But they weren't. So Right. Exactly. <laughs> so what did they have to be upset about? Now, if they were paying dad money and he still went to welfare, then they complained about something, but they weren't doing either. And so that again caused outrage. Tell me about your brothers and sisters very briefly, but the story I'm most interested in is Vanessa and the bus driver. Um, I'll start, I'll start uh, chronologically. My oldest sister, Raphael, um, I kept my distance from her as a kid. She, uh, she was very much a tomboy. Always had a, a ponytail though, a, braid, a braided ponytail, and she loved to ride horses but she tolerated me, that's, that's the best way to put it, in that <laughs> she thought I was a spoiled brat, and I was. And I, uh, 
even while I had a hard time communicating, I was very good at figuring out people's tells and body language, and so I was very good at manipulating people to get what I want, as a lot of kids are. But um, Raphael and I always kept a safe distance, but we have since become very, very close friends. She owns her own medical practice in Bend, Oregon, uh, a great woman, and uh, I have a lot of respect for her. And then my second sister, Vanessa, was very much my caretaker. Your protector. Yeah, she was my surrogate mom, I guess you could say, when mom wasn't around. And she loved to just take me and show me off to everybody she knew and take me to school. And sometimes I remember I would just sit at the foot of her desk while she was doing something and I would just play in a coloring book. You could do that in Montana. Those were good days. And when I got old enough to start taking kindergarten, uh, we would take the bus to Corvallis and then bus back into Pinesdale. But we had this die-hard bus driver named George, uh, you know, uh, just permanently stun sunburnt neckline because he was always out farming during the day. And then he would go and pick us up. And, but he loved, he, he would just yell at the kids all the time. And so you never said anything. You just sat there in silence the whole bus drive back. Which was his objective, you know. Oh, yeah, it was. Okay. And if, if he moved, he'd look up on that, you know, those huge yeah. rearview mirrors <laughs> yeah. that the yeah. bus drivers right. has. He's like, hey, I don't do anything. I'm like, okay. And, but then one day, I was walking and getting on the bus. And I guess he said something to me. I didn't hear him. Um, he said something to my back, and I have a hard time hearing when things aren't said to me. So I can't read his lips. I didn't know he was addressing me. And my sister behind me, Vanessa, just right behind me, she just turned, hands on her hips. She's, and because George started getting mad, and he said, what are you, deaf? Vanessa turns and hands on her hips and says, yes, he's deaf, as a matter of fact, George. You know, <laughs> what are you going to do about it? <laughs> and, you know, Vanessa was very much protective of me. And uh, I adored her and she adored me. And, you know, we were all very close because there were five of us within eight years. The third sister, the middle child, Tara, she and I have a very good relationship now, but we did not get along as kids. She, she first off was very much wanting to be my babysitter, and I didn't like that. But then also she was the youngest daughter, and so therefore there was a class between being the youngest daughter and I the youngest child. Right. And so it's, it, it's natural. Knowing what I know now, she's a social worker and I'm more of a, you know, I am an historian, but I love the psychological analysis of history. So I'm kind of a blend of that. And so, I mean, we can obviously talk about it now. We just laugh about it and we get along very well now. But at the time, uh, she drove me crazy. <laughs> But then my older brother, Court, two years older than me, he and I were best friends. And uh, he, was, he was the toughest kid in town. He had a little mullet going on and everything. And he, he was a tough kid. He was the athlete. And, um, oh, yeah, he could have easily been whatever he wanted to, except for a bad turn in health with back problems. So because that's the Allred family. That's, that, yeah, that's the But there's one important member we haven't talked about, your first dog. Yeah, send the dog. That's what I called him as a kid. Oh, I loved him to death. I can't wait to talk about him <laughs> because I get a little emotional. He knew he was the alpha dog, very protective. And he knew, he understood me. And even though he couldn't talk to you, he knew what was going on. And so he, um, he was very much a part of my life. And as a kid, I hated going to school because as you know, most kids were pretty brutal to other kids. Kids are brutally honest. And so when you have the big hearing aids in your ear and you're taller than mostly everybody in the whole school as a first grader, and you talk funny, you're gonna be a, an easy target for bullying. And so I was very quiet and introspective as a kid. And so I would just go home and just play with Sam. You know, he and I would just take walks, play in the back lawn. I just couldn't wait to get home. And uh, he was always there, always about 20, 22 months when we realized that he was hearing impaired uh, severely. And I remember just bawling and crying on the way home from the doctor's office and talking to Vance. And I just knew that he would have a difficult life, that people would make fun of him, and that he wouldn't ever be able to do all of the things that we would want for him. So I get to say I was wrong and I was right. Um, I was right in that it was difficult mm -hmm. and people have made fun of him 
uh, it wasn't very challenging life. I was wrong to ever think that we could ever put any limitations on Lance. Lance is going to do whatever Lance wants to do. And so that was very reassuring as a mother. <laughs> it is a wonderful story. My parents came home devastated, knowing that everything they had believed Pinesville to be was now a sham. Rather than a safe haven for the people of God, it was a place where women were not safe in their homes. Rather than being ruled by the teachings of Jesus Christ, it was ruled by the whims and tempers of men. At the time, I was too young to understand. And looking back, it's just so silly that it even happened. And that my mom's youngest sister, my beautiful Aunt Audra, she, she and her high school sweetheart, you know, as I say, just perfectly, basically to the T, reenacted Bruce Springs into the river. And that happens. And, you know, it, it, it was sad and tragic, but it's okay. In rural 1980 polygamous commune Pinesdale, oh, the horror. You know, it basically was just, you may as well have the scarlet letter painted on your chest. Sean was told to go and take Audrey from home because she was now his property and go to Lope and marry her without anyone's permission. And dad intervened. Um, and the leaders of the All Red Group in Pinesdale were very upset, not really over the issue, but the fact that Dad would even dare to challenge their authority. Right. And that led to a lot of hostility, and the tension was just so bad that we couldn't stay there anymore. So where do you move to? We moved to Salt Lake City, well actually a suburb of Salt Lake, Murray, Utah, and we settled with my father's mother and my father's older brother. You're in about seventh grade, you're about 12 years old, your parents file for bankruptcy, they run a youth conference group. What do they discover there? Dad had, in a, in a roundabout way, a very funny way, had actually become maybe the most influential man of the All Red group. And, but the fact that he didn't have a second wife, he wasn't eligible to be a candidate to become a quote unquote apostle or mm -hmm. a ordained a prophet. But he was very much the right-hand man of his uncle, Owen, who was the, considered the prophet at the time. So dad became very privy to a lot of important information. And we had discovered that several leaders of the All Red Group had been sexually abusing their children for years. Mom and dad got hints of it from time to time in Pinesdale, but some of it was they chose not to see it even though they were seeing it, because again, when you're investing so much into this cause, sure. you don't want anything to rattle your paradigm. Yeah. And so they were able to sometimes maybe not fully process it because they didn't want to, but they knew stuff was going on, but that was just kind of on the outer fringes with the weirdos that sometimes do gravitate towards those settings. Um, but they felt that as, 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 a, as a whole, everything was good. But when we discovered that the leaders had been doing it, we're like, okay, if these are men of God, then why is this happening? And even at the age of 12, I mean, the law of deduction, you know, by deducing this situation, you realize, you know, yeah, this doesn't make any sense. If it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. And so if these are men claiming to be men of God and they're sexually abusing their children well against the commandments of God, either they're frauds or else God is a fraud. It's one or the other, you know. And as a 12-year-old, you can easily see that. And I knew, I knew we were done. And mom and dad knew we were done. And we all expected the rest of the Albright group to fall apart, but it didn't. Detective Forbes shows up at your house. Your family flees. You have $5 to rebuild your life. <laughs> dad had actually been approached by Detective Forbes who had been uh, a detective for the county sheriff who was very much aware of the, uh, the, the abuse going on in the All Road Group. And he found out that Dad was leaving and knew a lot of information, so he started to work with Dad. Um, and we wanted to leave. Dad had actually, by this time, from his Uncle Owen, had received the deed and will to an entire house and the property, which was unheard of in the All Road Group. Mm -hmm. Everyone was like, what are you doing? Oh, and why are you giving Lance his property? And he goes, well, Lavance kind of deserves it, but also, from what we know now, there was some property tax stuff they didn't want to have to pay, so they gave it to us. And we decided, okay, we're not going there anymore to church unless Owen cleans it up. And people were getting angry at us because people want to stay in their paradigms. 
And I have a lot of respect for my father and my mother to be able at the age of 42 cut their losses and move on. What courage that took. It, it really is amazing, remarkable, because, you know, they, they put the safety of, of their own children well ahead of their own fragile egos to be able to say, you know, I want my daughters to be able to have these things in life, and I don't care if maybe the first 42 years of my life were a lie. I still have a great family, I have a beautiful wife, and that's enough for me, I can move on. But a lot of people, one, like my aunts who were in plural marriages, they couldn't just up and leave because when they're supposed to tell the second wife, hey, good luck, we'll take the kids, or you take the kids. But also, when they're living on this property owned by the AUB, they may have built a house in Pinesdale, but the property is owned by the AUB, so they have no equity. They can't just sell the house and leave, so they have nothing to go to. And so while Pinesdale wasn't a, a fenced-in compound, it very much had very firm emotional and psychological borders. And just as you know, it's the, the analogy with the bear in the cage at the zoo in that the tiny bear was in this, the bear was in this tiny cage and people thought it was inhumane and they gave it a bigger cage, but the bear would never go further than the original distance of his cage to get its food. And human nature is very much the same. And so people didn't want to have to go through that process and really analyze what it is that they were doing and why. And so they, they, would, they didn't want to say, oh, well, the first 30 years of my life were a lie. Now what? But then you realize that that doesn't make them very dissimilar from people in monogamy. Because how often do you see people stay in unhappy or unhealthy relationships? Just because they're like, well, I've been married now for five years. If I get divorced now, it was all a waste. So, right. And so you realize it's not that much different. But then also some people could leave, but they just didn't want to let go of the idea that they were special. That I'm a son of a prophet, so therefore I'm automatically going to heaven. And when you're when you, when you raised with that entitlement, it's hard to let it go. But at the same time, it's also very liberating to get out of that mindset and say, you know what, there's a big world out there. I can do whatever I want to do with my life. And, and they did. Yeah. They did. And you pick up a basketball for the first time when you're really, when you're in about eighth grade, and you are starting to experience some OCD. In a positive way, my obsession my compulsion to play through scenarios of what I shouldn't have done on the court and what I'd do the next time is part of what fueled me. My obsession demanded perfection and is what drove me and motivated me to keep working and working to constantly make up for the mistakes I made on the court. I was my own worst critic and will always be. No matter what negative thing anyone says of me on the court, I have already said something much meaner to myself. You also have asthma. You write in your book that basketball does not come naturally to you, but you make Hallelujah the Bryant team, and things take off from there. It was a fortunate timing for me, really, because at that time in my life, as we left the all Red group, I was also starting to go through adolescence and puberty and different phases, and it's a weird time for anyone in their life. And so you start to have these thoughts going on inside your head. You're like, okay, am I sinning by having these thoughts? Because you're raised in a society like Pinesdale, you don't think, let alone talk about these things. And, you know, so I began to have these thoughts of hell and sin and uh, God's punishment. And as we left the All Red group, there was so much transition going on around me that I didn't have much of a safety net or comfort zone. And so I began to analyze a lot of things that really, the thing about OCD you have to know and understand is that we know these thoughts are stupid. We know they're irrational. We know that the impulse to go flick that light switch is just completely ridiculous, but we have to do it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, who knows what happens, but we just don't want to find out. Mm -hmm. We have to do it. We have to think about these things. And my compulsion became to pray. I would sneak away in the middle of class go pray. Heavenly Father, I'm sorry for having these thoughts. I didn't, I didn't mean to. Please don't be angry with me. Please don't send me to hell. And so I was very much the victim of a broody God, an angry God, and one that I had been raised to believe was there. And so at that time, though, fortunately, we moved to a new part of Salt Lake, a new life, and we had joined the mainstream LDS church. And so therefore, I was adapting to my new lifestyle and I didn't have any friends and so it just made sense to hey I'll start playing basketball as a way to fit in at this new school and start playing and making new friends and also in that year my eighth grade year I grew from 5'10 to 6'4 
and so it just <laughs> made sense. You know, I slept a lot that year. I was in pain, but you know, hey, it's uh, it was fun to have a sense of camaraderie that I could just go and step on the basketball court and just play and have fun. And I didn't have to worry about talking. I happened to turn on the radio one Saturday night, and Bill Littlefield, who I like a lot, he's been on the show, as a matter of fact, um, his program, It's Only a Game. I tuned in, and you were speaking. And you were telling the story of playing basketball. Your dad's up in the stands. The referee blows the whistle, and you don't behave the way he wants you to. So tell us the rest of that story. Uh, you know, it's, this was the mid '90s, back when it was really cool to, you know, raise your hands at the foul line, whatever. You weren't waving them; you just stand there and hold them as though somehow you think it's actually going to change or affect someone's free throw. But we were young and stupid, and so we would do that. And the ref, you know, kept blowing his whistle, but I don't play with my hearing aids in because of the sweat problem, but also because of the noise and everything. It just creates so much feedback that it's shut down. And so I've always learned to be, uh, I learned to be a visual player. I learned to watch and recognize people's patterns and physical responses. And so it becomes more of a game of chess and you recognize tendencies. And that's why I love basketball. It's a beautiful game. And so this ref kept blowing this whistle on me and kept giving this kid the ball back from the free throw line. So he shot eight free throws. Eight free throws. I've never heard of it. <laughs> yeah. And then they won. So he finally made his two free throws <laughs> and they won. And my dad went and talked to the official after the game. He says, excuse me, sir, can you explain why, um, what was happening at the end of the game? And the ref said, well, that kid, he was just being a brat. I mean, I told him to put his arms down, but he just looked at me and completely ignored me. And, oh, I mean, what a brat. And that's the PG context. And my dad takes my hearing aids out and says, I'm sorry, but my son's deaf. And he couldn't hear what you were saying to him. It's just, the ref's face goes ghostly white. I'm sure he didn't sleep for a week, but I got, <laughs> I got over it. You it got over it. Yeah, it On fun. to the next game. Yeah, because, I mean... It, I have fun with stereotypes. Um, you can say what you want about generalizing people, but rather than getting offended about it, uh, I'm the deaf kid whose father raised him on Helen Keller jokes. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, so you have to be able to laugh at yourself and find some humor in life. Because if you take it too seriously, you're just going to give yourself a heart attack. And so, but the fun thing about stereotypes as well, it's fun to prove people wrong. It's fun to see them squirm and have to eat their own words. And so rather than getting oh, all pent up about it, I was like, okay, fine. Well, you can go over to that section of people in my life that say I can't do it, and I'll go over here and prove you wrong like I have a nasty habit of doing. And, you know, and that just goes to my story of the college professor who tried to cite me for plagiarism because he didn't think an athlete could write such a good paper. And rather than getting offended about it, I just figured out a way to prove it to him, and he ate his words. And so it's, it's fun. That was a great story in the book. All right, you're in high school now, and your parents and your sisters and brothers, they're all supporting you. They're getting up, they're running you to and from the gym, I don't know how many times a day. But you say they're all in line to help you chase your dream. So the question that I have for you, Lance, is when you're in high school, playing basketball, excelling, what is your dream at this point? I would like to look back and say, oh yeah, I had, I knew I was gonna be an NBA player. I'm, I don't, know if, I don't know if I can be honest about that. But I mean, but then the counter to that, who doesn't step into an empty basketball gym and with a ball in their hand when no one's watching, count down three, two, one. You know, buzzer beater shot, they won the NBA title. I mean, who doesn't do that? When he gave the team days off, I'd still ask Coach Rupp if we could work out the next morning by ourselves. I knew it would be hard and painful as he pushed me to the limit and many times passed it to the point where I'd vomit right onto the hardwood. But I loved it. I loved the pain and discomfort. I loved the sense of accomplishment I felt once it was all over. I loved to sit by myself there in the bleachers of the empty gym and be lost in stalled thought, my mind and body too tired to think. It was my high, a natural high. Those mornings were the purest form of basketball I ever knew. Just me, Rupp, and a ball. No money, no boosters, no politics. It was the pure love and innocence of the game when it was still a game for me. We both worked and sweated, our shoes squeaking and echoing out the gym and down the empty hallways. I'd pay to have those moments again, those moments of hard work and sacrifice, 
when I knew not what to expect as far as what my future held, with no sense of entitlement, no reward or motive in sight other than just the pure love of the game. I had no idea if I was ever going to be good enough to play college ball. We were challengers of the unknown. You continue to write in your book that high school is a difficult time, even if you're not, quote, a freakish giant, even if you're not deaf, but you continue to play and you excel. And the college offers start to come in, but they don't want you to sit on your laurels, so to speak. So they don't tell you that the offer you're most waiting for is there for you. So tell us about what it's like when you find out that your college dream has arrived. The timing seems so perfect. My, as my junior year of high school ended, the University of Utah also went to the national championship game and lost to Kentucky. And it was only four blocks away from my parents' house, the University of Utah. And I was very much a hometown kid, and I loved that place. I loved the community that had supported me. And so it was very important that I remain there. And so I very much wanted to be a part of that. And so here I was receiving offers from Kansas, Stanford, Purdue, and I'm passing those all up just to I'm not passing them up, but I'm receiving them, but I'm not really appreciating them because I'm wondering why isn't the University of Utah, I'm only four blocks away from, why haven't they offered me a scholarship yet? And so it was very perplexing to me, but what I found that the University of Utah had actually offered me a scholarship well before anyone ever did. But Coach Rupp never told me at the time. And it's funny, I understand why he didn't tell me, but he should have known me well enough by that time, you know, I'm not the type of person that's going to be satisfied. Because I'm the type, you know, our accomplishments are quickly lost in the achievement of new goals, or the setting of new goals. And so, once you get to one plateau, you want to move on to another one. And so, Rupp, Rupp knew that, but part of him didn't want to tell me, but mom and dad actually knew as well, but they didn't tell me. I was just sweating and laboring and going through these camps all across the country and I become a top 100 recruit and why haven't I heard anything from the University of Utah yet and then I go to this personal little big man camp at the University of Utah and then after the camp is over Coach Majerus calls me into uh, the film room and he sits down with me and Coach Rupp and says you have a scholarship just like that. Tell us a little bit about what the program was in Utah. From a high school kid's perspective or from a college kid while I'm in there? No, when you're in there. What are you doing? <laughs> well, what is your day-to-day -day like to be on that basketball team? Your life is ran to the T. Even in the summertime, they will call you up the night before to say, this is where you need to be. This is your weekly regimen. This is where you have to do. If you don't do it, even you, you will not have a scholarship the next year. And so it's very much, very demanding. Every now and then, Coach Majerus would give you a little compliment, and it would mean the world to you. But here I was, I was just a young kid with now with aspirations of, okay, if I'm a top 100 recruit in high school, maybe I could be an NBA player. And so I see Coach Majerus getting guys to the NBA, and he's now on the national stage. I'm thinking, okay, this guy is my one chance to get to the NBA. And so you put him on a pedestal, and you hang on every word that he says. And that was my flaw. That was my fault. That was my error. Nobody, though, was working harder than you were. Now, I, I will never say that I worked harder than everybody else, but I, I will say that no one worked harder than no me. No one worked harder than you. Yeah. Yeah, I know that. I know that for sure. And just because having learned from the work ethic of my father and my mother, um, I wasn't going to be a, a living, walking, talking irony. In that, at this time as well, right when I was going to the University of Utah, my mom had graduated as a commencement speaker for the University of Utah. And this is a lady that had gone back and gone back to school after she raised all of us kids. And so I had these parents with, with tremendous work ethic, and so it was just in my nature to be that way. I definitely am my own worst critic. No one can say anything to me that I guarantee you I have not already said to myself, that I will beat myself to a bloody pulp as far as my demands to be the best I can be. And so when you put my type of personality 
with a coach like Rick Majerus, who was a brilliant, brilliant coach. The man knew what he was doing, a brilliant mind. But at what point does brilliance cross into insanity? At what point does rational become irrational? You know, you can't really define that line. But mixing in his personality with mine was a recipe for disaster. On the surface, we looked like a great match because he demanded hard work and effort from his players. And on the surface, we were a beautiful combination. But when it got down to the daily personality uh, flaws of each of us, it, it, it was not good. And, but again, I'd take blame for that. Had I not been so fragile emotionally as a kid, in that when I started playing basketball, I, so, I didn't want people to view me as you know, this deaf, obsessive, compulsive kid with weird thoughts in his head. And so I'd rather they view me as just a simple jock or an arrogant basketball player. And so I put up this facade around me to keep people away from me because I was very insecure in who I was emotionally as a person. And so when you take that emotional dynamic up to the University of Utah and play for a guy like Rick Majerus, it's going to fall, it's going to collapse, because he, he does such a good job of cracking, finding and manipulating your soft spots. He knows how to get to people's buttons and he knows it and he breaks you down and after he breaks you down he's like yeah you know you're not any good anymore as a basketball player because I mean you get to this point where you're just afraid to even shoot the ball well I can I tell you how I can support that last season coach Majerus at the St. Louis University his team set a record low in points scored in a game I think it was something like the low 20s and I can tell you why I know exactly what those kids are feeling they don't want to shoot the ball because when you're the one that takes the shot, you're the one that's gonna be analyzed the most in film session. And so you're so terrified to do anything. And so you're like, okay, if I'm not any good as a basketball player, then what good am I as a person? And but no, that was my flaw. And I, so when I couldn't hide behind basketball anymore, I was so vulnerable that I actually started to break down. And had I been more astute or emotionally intelligent at the time, I could have maybe better handled it. You know, Lance, you're the worst of all. You use your hearing as an excuse to weasel your way through life. You're a disgrace to cripples. And if I were in a wheelchair and I saw you play basketball, I'd shoot myself. This was in front of everyone, the entire team, the coaches, and Coach Rupp. I said nothing, which only made Majerus more angry, as he could never get a reaction out of me. But inside, it ruined me. Here was a man that I had dedicated three years of my life to, that I had idolized, that I had sweated and labored to play for since I was 16. He had turned against me and betrayed me. Had I never met the man, or had he meant little to me, I would have laughed at what he had just said. To never tell your parents of these type of statements of what I will call the abuse that you are enduring. You write in your book that you even you really even considered suicide over quitting. Why? It, it wasn't so much of a suicide that like my life sucks, no. It was more like I just wanted the voices inside my head to go away. I didn't want to have to be stuck with the what ifs or the little demons inside your head that pick at you. And so it wasn't so much of a, sure I was depressed, but it wasn't more like, oh, just woe is me, there's nothing left to live for, kind of suicidal. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I didn't tell anyone or complain about it because, you know, I didn't want to be that kid, oh, mom and dad, the bully said this to me, you know, I didn't want to sound like that. And plus, Majerus was also very good. He goes, oh, Lance, I said that. You can go home and cry to your mom now, the special education teacher. And so he, he, he knew how to do things. He knew how to manipulate, manipulate people. So in a way, he basically challenged me to go tell my mom, and so I wouldn't. And it was ironic because my mom was getting her master's from this very same institution, the University of Utah, in special education. And there's a common misnomer that I filed a complaint against Rick Majerus for a lawsuit. I never did. We saw his body language change. Right. We saw his self-confidence go down. We right. saw that he could not hold on to a basketball. Right. It'd be passed to him and it would just go through his hands like butter. He couldn't, he, he could no longer play basketball. So we're aware that something's going on. No, we do not know the degree to which it is. And when he finally tells us, of course, it's, it's devastating. And 
he doesn't tell us until he's made the decision that he's leaving. And of course, we're never going to be, you know, you need to stick it out. No, mm -hmm. we just, you're right, Lance, you, you go ahead, you need to leave. I did write a letter of complaint. That's where I think the, the fallacy comes that he um, filed a lawsuit, but he didn't. I just wrote a letter of complaint and asked that it be put in Majerus's file and I sent it to our major fund provider. Mm -hmm. um, I sent it to the university president and the board of regents. So anyway, it, it, was, it was heard, but nothing was done. There was and no you're response. both now seriously involved yourselves at the University yes, of Utah. Yes, I was um, very much involved in the special education department. Part of it is, uh, had been fun interesting, not funny, funny, but funny, interesting, that I had given the um, commencement speech where I talk about Lance, that he's number 41 playing on the floor of the Huntsman Center and dreams do come true, realizing that his dream very quickly turned into a nightmare. I just wanted to leave, get out of there, but the University of Utah itself filed an investigation, basically just to cover their bases, to make sure that they weren't liable for a lawsuit. And I knew what they were doing. It was a charade. It was a farce. And, but a lot of people then pinned that on me, saying I had started it, but I didn't. I just wanted out of there. And, you know, it's, I'm very careful in my book. When I tell of the negative things that happened with Coach Majerus, I make sure that I can vouch that there's someone else there. Someone else can vouch what I say. But, As a lawyer, I thought you did a great job with that. Yeah, I was very, very, yeah. But I wasn't going to let it come down to a battle of hearsay. That's right. And, you know, but I had a fun time with him, too. I mean, the man had a lot of good qualities, but he also had a lot of bad qualities. And, you know, to paint him in one light as one or the other wouldn't do him justice. In hindsight, we all could have done things better. But at the end of the day, I don't blame Majerus for my shortcomings at University of Utah. They're mine and mine alone. But at the same time, I can therefore give him no credit for my future success as well. So it's a fair trade-off. You're being kind, but that's consistent with who you are. Tell us about your red shirt year and your move over to Weber State. Almost every place I go outside of, the universe, outside of Utah calls it Weber State, but uh, it's Weber. When I left the University of Utah, I was ready to quit basketball. I had gone to the point that I actually hated looking at a basketball. I just hated it. And I was done. And no, I was, you know, no offers were coming. But except for the very first day I left the University of Utah, I got a phone call from Weaver State. Coach Joe Cravens, a wonderful man, had at one point been an assistant for Coach Majerus. And the man, the two men could be, could not be more polar opposite. And Coach Cravens is one of the most Christian men I've ever known. He was a great guy, and he was the only coach, the only Division I school to offer me a scholarship. Only one. And to say, I, I'm not going to come out and say I was blackballed because I have no proof of it, but uh, 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 there's no point in calling it out. But it, it ended up for the best because Weber State is only a half hour north of Salt Lake City. Lance, big mud, says, no, I'm not going to play for Weber State, you know, when he hung up and he, and he walked out. And uh, I stepped in and I called Kerry Rupp on the phone, Lance's high school coach, who was one of the most credible people you've ever known. And I said, Kerry, Lance just told Joe Cravens he's not going to take it. And he says, I'll call him. <laughs> and he hung up. And uh, sure enough, so Coach Kerry Rupp called Lance up. And, and Rupp was that kind of person who could get in his face. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I didn't feel I had the right as a father to tell him that he had to because I hadn't paid the price in basketball. That was not my, my forte. And but Carrie Rupp could. And, and I think that's another, that's another rule or the parents need to learn is, is there are times when we as parents don't have cachet in particular areas and to be humble enough to reach out to those people who, who do, do have that influence. And fortunately, our children have been surrounded by a lot of people like that to whom we have been able to call as I did to Coach Rupp. Coach Rupp can you please do this? And he did. He made that phone call, and, and Joe Cravens was just a miracle worker in Lance's life. For a while, I thought, oh, I need to get completely to the other side of the country to get away from Majerus. But you realize 
Proximity has nothing to do with it. It's about drawing your own emotional boundaries with yourself. And he could have been 500 miles away or 20 miles away, and I still would have been going through the same issues. You have to face them. Ultimately, you yes. play against yeah. Utah. Yeah. How did that go? It went really well, actually. My junior year, after my redshirt year at Weber State, I played against Utah, and I played very well. Because usually the players that leave Utah's program end up being nothing, and they, mm -hmm. that's usually true. And so everyone's like, huh, interesting, what's going on here? And so there, around that time, uh, ironically, the same reporter that had gotten me in trouble actually at Utah, totally against any doing of mine, was able to break the story on what happened at Weber State. And shortly after that came out, 10 days after the article came out, um, Jairus resigned due to health reasons, uh, a bad heart, and caught a plane to Santa Barbara. If someone's going to have heart surgery, I don't think they'd catch a plane to Santa <laughs> Barbara. But at that point, though, I was happy at Weaver, and so I had actually almost moved on. I, was, I had a new life up there. I was playing well. I enjoyed my team. I loved my coach. And I was finally, finally battling a lot of the OCD stuff, and that Coach Cravens had really helped me to come to terms with it. He was one of the people that really encouraged me to go on medication. And I'll never forget when he told me that, you know, Lance, you having to take medication for OCD, to me is no different than your teammate Brad having to take insulin for his diabetes. And, and he's it, right. He's right. But at the time, I couldn't view it that way. Because, I mean, you know, the biggest weakness of all is the ability, the inability to admit that you have a problem. Right. It usually takes a stronger person to really step forth and ask for help. You know, as, you know, I'm a Montana kid, born in Montana, so I love the river runs through Norman McLean. That's the story of my life and my brother. And, you know, it, it, the question is asked in there, why is it the people that need the most help are the ones that don't ask for it? And I was kind of in that boat for a long time. And Coach Cravens really helped me get across that point. And, you know, the trick is, you know, medication doesn't fix the problem. It just slows the brain down so you're actually able to go through and try to rewire your brain and develop better thought patterns. Mm -hmm. And but the thing is, a lot of people don't want to go that far. They don't really want to have to really, truly internalize and analyze themselves and their true motives in life and where they could do better. They don't want to have to truly take accountability for all of their actions. But I said, if I want to truly get over my OCD or at least learn to corral it or harness it, I am going to accept full accountability for my shortcomings. I'm not going to hide behind my OCD and say, oh, I was just having a rough day or whatnot. At this time in your life, a new puppy comes into your world. Tell us about Mac. <laughs> oh, Mac. Uh, McMurrin is actually his full name. It's my Scottish family ancestral name. He's my Scotty dog, my Scottish terrier. Oh, I love him to death. He's, uh, I actually found him from a breeder in Missouri, and I drove all the way over to Missouri to pick him up, and oh, I loved him. I got to pick him out of the litter right from the box. Uh, I got the first pick, and I knew he was my guy. And uh, oh, he's a spunky little thing. People, people tend to think Scotty dogs are grandma dogs, lap dogs. They're not. They were bred in Scotland to be badger hunters, and they're pretty thick. And if you ever picked up Mac, he's a solid, solid 32 pounds. And, He's a smaller dog, but he's just all muscle. And so he's a, he's a spunky little guy, and um, he's very much different from Sen. All right, now, take us to the NBA summer camps and tell us what's going on with Lance. After graduating from Weber State, for most of my senior year, I led the nation in rebounding. And once the season was over and the postseason came, it just kind of happened that I didn't get as many games and I lost the rebounding title. And so it was important to me to really have that rebounding title coming from a small school and a small conference. And I lost it behind two guys who are now currently in the NBA with very nice contracts. And, um, and that's tough because you then see most of it is timing. Um, it's, you learn from my first NBA experience in the summer league, you can be just as good or better than the next player but so much of it is timing. So much of life is timing, Exactly, Lance. exactly. It's and a, we can't it's control pill. that. You can't. You may be better than this player, but are you what the team needs at the time to fit the bill? But then also, what is talent? It's all in the eye of the beholder. And um, 
you and I could be watching a player right now, and you could say he's garbage, and I could say, oh, he, oh, he's a true diamond in the rough. He's going to be an all-star. I mean, it's all completely up to personal opinion and whim. And so at that point, I mean, it's like trying to break into Hollywood, really. I mean, what producer is going to give you the money? <laughs> it really is. And so it, it was tough. It was heartbreaking for um, me to go through the NBA draft process. And here I was, a proven player, 18 and 12, 18 points, 12 rebounds a game my senior year in college. And you sit there and you realize that you're not even on anyone's radar because it's almost like kids at Christmas in that one GM doesn't want you until another GM wants you. If they don't want you, they're safe to overlook you because you'll never be given the chance to shine and make them look bad for passing yeah. over you. Yeah. So therefore, they don't have to answer to an owner for that. And so it's, it becomes very much a game of um, boys with toys, I guess. And uh, it becomes very political. And you realize it's a business. It's not... It's not all about basketball, it's not fun and games. It is the entertainment business down to the core. In Europe, it's a little more lively. And so, I mean, it, it, we'll see what happens there. And, but when I did summer camp with the Clippers, I mean, I did everything I could with what they gave me. But it's just, you know, fighting the powers that be. I mean, you could play the most brilliant game of all time, but they pretty much have already made up their minds before camp has even started who's going to play and who's going to get the recognition and the attention. And, you know, I enjoyed the time they gave me. I learned a lot. And, but they basically said, you know, you're, this isn't your home. And so I had to go over that year to start out in Turkey, my professional year, my first year as a professional, as a rookie. I signed a pretty good contract as a rookie in Turkey. But, uh, Turks don't pay. I hate to generalize like that, but that's basically, that was the, the stereotype they had before I went and the stereotype they still have long after I've left. And, you know, just because you sign a contract in Turkey for this amount of money doesn't really mean anything. That only means that's the most they're going to pay you. You know, it, it, was, a, it was a tough go. And plus also because Turkey doesn't have a player union. And when you're not a citizen of that country, what are you going to do? Right. And so I remember I was there for six weeks, and they hadn't paid me. And so I finally knocked on the door, and I said, uh, I'm sorry. I finally went and said to them, hey, if you don't pay me, I'm not playing in the game tomorrow. And they came and knocked on my door, and they said, okay, Lance, we're taking you to the airport. I mean, what am I going to do? And so it, it's, it's important that people know that basketball is not all glitz and glamour and fun. The media focuses on so much of the longevity players with the huge contracts that people get this conception that it's all glitz and glamour. It's not. Let me, I want the audience, Lance, to know who you really are. Your first contract was $20,000, or the first serial payment mm -hmm. of the $90,000 contract mm -hmm. sure. was $20,000. What did you do with that money? I took a loan out against it and gave it to mom and dad so they could pay off some of their debts and help my sister pay for her wedding. Wow. You know. I would like to think anyone else would have done the same thing had they had parents like mine. And I think that's right. I've met your parents. I'll talk to your parents. They seem to be the most wonderful people. They are. But I must say, they couldn't have a finer son. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, thank you. Kenny Maine, in the introduction to your book, writes that the average fan has totally lost perspective on what it takes to make it to the NBA. I have a different question, Lance. What if you hadn't made it? Would I have gotten to the point where I am and where I'm at now? In that, sure, I was called up, and Cleveland gave, signed me for the rest of the season, but was I really given an opportunity while I was there? Not really. But was I able to finally say I got there? Yeah. But seeing what I saw in Cleveland helped me gain perspective that, again, 
It's just a business. And so much of it is about timing. And at the end of the day, the only person that's going to validate me is me. And that is without doubt the toughest lesson I have ever had to learn in life. Because so many people need other people to validate them, to acknowledge the price and cost that they have paid in life to get where they are and what they have done. But that usually the people that you most want to validate you are the ones that will never validate that you. That never do it. Exactly. In February, my 26th birthday approached and the family gathered in Boise to meet up and see a game of mine. I played for one minute, getting two rebounds. And then, having done nothing wrong, I was subbed out. I looked up and saw my family in the stands. There I was, turning 26, in debt, with nothing to show for myself, sitting on the bench in the D-League, making $12,000 a year. I couldn't even look at them from across the arena. The rest of my siblings were carving their way through the world, doing their best to make themselves alive, while I was chasing a pipe dream. Before the game was even over, I snuck off to the locker room and began to violently vomit blood. That night, the family gathered at the hotel where they all gave me gifts. I have never been a fan of birthdays. I think that on my birthday, if anyone should be given a gift to say thank you, it should be me. I couldn't look my siblings in the eye as I opened their gifts. They knew I was in pain. They knew it was difficult for me to accept their generosity when I had nothing to give them. I still owed them money. Yet here they were, giving me more. That night, as I lay in bed, my stomach churning, eating out my insides, I came to the conclusion that I was living in a fantasy, and it was time to grow up. Do you know that he's going to make it? Well, oh, that he's going to make it? That he's going to make it? No. I, yeah. No. It was, it was at that moment, here, there, we all are, all of his brothers and sisters, and all, all of his spouses, and mom and dad, and... Uh, and we saw how hard he worked for so long and none of his dreams had come true. They had all turned into disappointment and nightmares and, uh, and all we could give him was love. Just that continual, unconditional love. And uh, my father stole every dream I ever had. And, and Tana's mom was always so wonderfully supportive to her and to me. Uh, so I had that example of a parent who stole all the dreams and a parent who supported us. And so, and all we could give him was love and tell him, Lance, you know, whatever you do, whatever you choose, wherever you go, we're all here for you, always. I read your book cover to cover, and I never got up until it was over. I couldn't. I couldn't put it down. So what's next for you? You like to be able to plan it, but in my life, the world of basketball, it's it's capricious, it changes every day. You don't know what's gonna happen. And so sometimes you just kinda of have to take it graciously. But hopefully within the next few weeks I will be signing a good contract in Italy and they have a player union there, which is good. And so therefore I know I will be secure. But uh, I'm about to finish up my second book, a historical fiction about a Teutonic Knight uh, in the 14th century, yes, I'm a nerd, but just, just read it. <laughs> you know, I take a lot of pride in being able to write my own memoirs because a lot of times you see biographies and you see that little name underneath the main name, which is their ghostwriter. And I kind of like, eh, because it's pretty difficult to sit with someone you don't really know and be brutally honest and tell all about your shortcomings as well as your good things because you don't want them to dislike you. And so therefore, you usually don't get all the angles but when you're sitting there with a piece of paper and there's no one else in the room it's a lot easier to analyze yourself and be honest about yourself and so that was what was important to me to go back with an historian's objective and analyze my life and make fun of myself and everyone around me and have a good time doing it after our interview with lance he met with his agent and he signed a contract to play in italy on the nsb napoli basketball team we wish him the very best you can keep track of Lance on Eurobasket.com. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, you be inspired and you be well.